Today, we discuss a unique research program developer partnership that is underway to measure program effectiveness based on youth feedback. I'm Suzanne Barnard, the Director of Evidence-Based Practice at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I will be your moderator today. The Annie E. Casey Foundation, with past contributions from the William T. Grant Foundation, has produced for the last six years or so, a series of convenings and webinars that we call Leading with Evidence. Our aim is to offer practitioners and researchers ways to immediately apply programs and practices to better deliver and strengthen the utility of our work. Today, in keeping with our focus, next slide please, on keeping with our focus on increasing the number of effective programs that reliably demonstrate improved outcomes for youth and young adults, we're going to shine a spotlight on the importance of data collection for evidence building combined with culturally responsive practices. You will hear from the developer of Latinos in Action, who will introduce his asset-based program to empower Latino youth. And later in the presentation, we will also hear from the developer of Hello Insight, who is working with Latinos in Action to build evidence to support the continued effectiveness of their model. Today, I'm happy to be joined by Dr. Jose Enriquez, the developer and director of Latinos in Action, and Sally Munamitsu, the co-founder of Hello Insight. But first, as always, I want to take a moment to go over some important housekeeping details for this webinar. After we hear from our presenters, we will have some time for questions. We will keep our attendees on mute, as we always do throughout the webinar, and we ask that you submit your questions by entering them in the Q&A window, which you see circled on the slide. You'll find that window in the lower right-hand corner of your webinar screen, and you can submit a question there to the panelists. If you are in full screen mode and want to ask a question, though, you may need to return to the event window uh, by using the drop-down controls at the top of your screen. I will also say that this presentation is being recorded, and the recording and slides will be available later at aecf.org. So I want to talk just a little bit about the mission of the evidence-based practice group, which is to promote the development and use of scientifically tested programs. And we do this through our strategies for building evidence and implementing and scaling what works. In order to do these things, we engage with researchers, system leaders, developers, practitioners, who understand not only the science of program development and testing, but also the strengths, culture, needs, resources of the communities that will be using them and the systems that will be implementing them. Our evidence-based strategies also contribute to the overall mission of the Annie E. Casey Foundation as we work together to develop solutions to build a brighter future for children, families, and communities. This slide just shows our uh, general approach to evidence building. When we talk about moving programs to scale, we are, we're really talking about uh, those programs that can clearly define their approach and have created a strong program design. They've documented this program design so that others can follow it uh, with a logic model or a manual or a strong process for data collection and analysis. Today, we focus on those top two steps, which are key to making sure there are more programs available that use evidence and practices um, that especially resonate with the experiences and culture and values of the communities within which we work. There are several reasons why we invest in the development of programs and practices for children and youth of color. Chief among them um, is an unmet need uh, and, and frankly a failure of the field to focus on developing evidence-based uh, based interventions. And examples are that um, even though brown and black children are the largest population of children served by child welfare systems, less than a quarter of the evidence-based programs and practices in national clearinghouses and databases include information about how those programs work specifically for children and youth of color. Secondly, culture and context matter. Um, culture itself frames how we think, uh, which then affects our values, our attitudes, our beliefs, and our ideas. 
Uh, anytime we talk about implementation, we should also be talking about a cultural match of programs to population. Uh, and then finally, um, including lived experience, uh, we believe helps people create more hopeful narratives or stories about their lives uh, and the difficulties they've faced or, or may still be facing. Program participants are um, just more likely to benefit in asset-based programs when they share a background with those who develop and deliver those services. So now um, I, I'm very happy to turn this presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Jose Enriquez, who will tell us more about Latinos in Action. Welcome, Dr. Enriquez. Thank you, Suzanne, and I, I really am happy to be here. I'm actually coming to you from South Florida, where I just spoke with uh, about 60 students um, in Palm Beach Central who will start Latinos in Action this next year. Um, and, you know, as I spoke to these young people, um, I just want to say to everybody, they give me hope. Um, just happy to be here. They come with so many assets. They're brilliant. They're talented. And that's what our system, I think, needs to understand that these young people, our English learners and others, come with so much. And what are we doing with that talent and all that asset and the schema they bring to the table? And I, I want to help you understand um, Latinos in Action um, by also helping you understand the history of it. And I'm um, so grateful for Annie, Casey, and, and all their help. But I want to start here um, because I think we all have amazing stories and, and I think we don't share them enough. Uh, I think especially now um, we need to share and we need to help people understand that uh, we come with all these amazing, um, this amazing culture and, and beauty uh, that makes us us. Um, on the far left is my abuela, my grandmother, um, uh, Rosario Hernandez Enriquez, who just uh, was a gem, um, really helped us understand many things in her own way, visionary, um, saw that there was no future in El Salvador. I was born in El Salvador. Um, I had a, a strong mother with the work ethic like no other, I always say, um, and uh, just enjoy um, learning from her uh, daily. Uh, and um, you know, I had a father who was great as well. He he wanted us to stay though in El Salvador, so I uh, you know could have stayed, uh, but my mom wanted more for us. He stayed. My mom left. My grandma had her leave, and a uh, 19 year old with three kids, uh, she came the hard way and came to the U.S. Uh, through Tijuana, um, got to L.A., and then sent for us three years later. Um, and I'm very grateful for, for her and her hard work. Um, what we want our, our young people to understand is that everybody along, everybody's lineage and history, somebody gave up everything so that we can have what we have today. And I, I don't want our young people to forever forget that. It's a, it's a pearl of great price and we can't just toss it and we want to use that sacrifice. So I'm grateful for my mom. Even today, she texted me and said, where's my sun shining today? And I, um, just an amazing person. Got into the system uh, in LA. I was an ESL student, um, had to realize really quick that education was the only way. Um, I got lucky, had some great mentors along the way, great adults, a coach who picked me up and said, I want you to wrestle. And I didn't really want to wear that singlet. And he said, I, you don't have to, and kind of lied to me. Um, I walked away and he said, I'll give you 20 bucks. I put it on and started wrestling. <laughs> Um, and did well. I was a California state champion, and that was what got my uh, got me a scholarship to wrestle it in Utah. And um, that's how I got my education. It was my ticket out of LA in many ways, and and then kind of went from there. The next slide, please. Um, our goal once I got to to Utah, I went into education because I wanted to, I guess, more than anything, empower our Latino youth. Um, I I wanted to give back everything I had received along the way, uh, along with mentors and people. I, I wanted to see our, our Latino youth in a different, I wanted people to see them in a different light. So um, in 2001, I started teaching. I, I began to realize that our, our youth were not connected to the system. They were not getting involved. So I went to my principal and I said, let me take 35 of these kids and teach them Spanish for natives. I knew he would go for that. And as I began to teach them Spanish for natives, um, different things, um, grammar, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I also wanted them to to learn about heroes, Latino heroes. We have so many, but not many are in our history books. 
And so as I began to talk about Rigoberta Menchu, Paulo Negro de Marquez, as a child and so forth, I, I, I thought about this really deep and thought we can teach them about Latino heroes or we can create our own. And that's where it all came to me and, and really thought, you know, why aren't we creating our own pipeline of heroes and role models? So I went back to my principal. I said, look, I want to take this native class and turn it into this. And he said, well, what is this? And I said, I want to call it Latinos in Action because I want people to understand the brilliance and talent these young people bring. And I want them to be in action so that we all can see these talents. And he looked at me and he said, it's, it's not in our course manual. And I said, I know it's not, trust me. And he did. Um, and so from there, um, you know, began to grow the program, you know, help people understand, um, you know, our mission, which is to align cultural values and practices of, um, and, and just really empower like, you know, youth to lead and strengthen their communities. Right. Next slide. Um, I, I want to talk about this because I, I want people to understand that Latinos in Action is actually a course. It's it's not an uh, it's an elective course, and in some states, it's a, it's actually a dual enrollment course. Um, like in in the state of Idaho right now is uh, we work with College of Southern Idaho. But um, in order to have Latinos in Action, there are four essentials, and and these are key essentials, and I want everybody to understand these essentials because they're so important to to um, really moving the needle um, with the masses. Like I always ask my principal, how, how do we begin to move the masses and not just certain kids and certain outliers that are gonna make it and come back, but how do we get all our kids involved, right? And, um, and so these next four essentials I'm gonna explain really have to do with um, everything, the framework really of Latinos in Action. And I'm so grateful again to Annie and Casey for helping us um, really see this through and creating a logic, plausible logic model. But this next slide, um, this this is a 30, 40, 30 model, which which is is so key to me. Um, you know, Latinos are not all the same. Um, and you know, when I was in LA growing up, I always I was an ESL student. And I always wondered why certain kids, especially some of the Chinitos, I would always call them, had different classes than I did and um, why I wasn't in those classes and, and um, just had a lot of questions. And as a teacher, then I, and from high school to then now a teacher was asking the same questions, right? Um, why aren't our L's taking AP and honors and so forth? Um, and um, so in this class, this 30, 40, 30 model is that 30% of this class, um, the makeup of this class are, are high achievers. You have them in your, in your courses, in your, in your classrooms and in the hallways. These are kids that are doing well, that understand how to navigate the system. Latinos who've had uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters who, who really understood and have that uh, culture and social capital to, to relate to them. And now they're doing well. And we need these kids though too, also in this class because we want them to help the others. And second, we never want them to forget their cultura and their language. And that the best way to keep, I would say, and maintain cultura and language is to give back to our community. And so the other 40% also are our invisible kids. And you know them, it's your out towels, right? Your long-term owls or your kids that are kind of coasting through the motions of school. Um, we, we have these kids that sometimes are just hiding um, and have so much talent and asset, but we, we need to have, have them develop it somewhere, right? Um, so we have this, it's 40% because it's a lot of those kids. And then the other 30 are English learners. And some switch 30, 30, 40 because there are more English learners that just need somewhere to develop their talents and also somewhere where they can shine, right? Una plataforma, a platform where they can come out of their ESL courses or ELD courses they're in all day, right? Um, because if you look at your cafeteria, you go into your classrooms, your hallways, and if the principal can tell me where their L's, that's the first thing that, uh, that tells me he, he understands, if you can't, then we got a long conversation. But I always say, look, where are they? Who are they hanging out with? And they're in, your English le language learners usually hang out with each other. And so their BICs and, and their CALPs, concept academic language and their basic and personal communicative skills, kind of stay in that circle, right? So if we take them out of that circle and into something like Latinos in Action, where the other 70% are kids who are doing well or better, right? Um, their language just starts to develop in so many ways, socially, 
but also their cognitive academic language begins to, to develop as well. So this is the first essential. The makeup of the class have, has got to be different tier students of Latino students in our schools so that they can start to help each other. The saddest thing is that you have so many Latino students and um, from first or kinder all the way up and sometimes they don't always help each other and, and we ought to have them help each other. This, this next slide is our second essential. And this goes to, again, service, right? First, they help each other as peers, but then I, I turn to the principals and I always say, look, this population is not decreasing, it's increasing. And they're coming their way, high school principal. So what are you doing about it? How are you being proactive and preempt instead of reactive and remediate? It's way more expensive on the remediation side. But what if we put role models and heroes, our own Latinos and Access students, in the elementary school at least twice a, twice a week during this class time, have them go mentor and tutor young ESL kids or other students who are struggling in literacy. Now, whoa, what a novel idea, right? Peer to peer in this, what we found obviously is that our young people, their self-esteem, our LIA students just skyrockets, especially our English learners, right? Can an English learner, ESL student at the high school level teach a kinder or first grader the basics of literacy? Yes, and learn at the same time? Yes, right? Both are edified here. Obviously, the young kid sees a role model. I want to be like him. I want to be like her when I get older. So this isn't going to go away. This isn't a fad. You're creating a pipeline of leaders because once they're, they leave kinder or first elementary school, they're going to want to go to the middle school and high school and be part of Latinos in Action where we have the course. And then this continues. This is how you start to move the masses, right? Because they, they want to give back. They naturally want to um, serve and give. Um, but we need a platform, again, somewhere where they can do it naturally and genuinely. And this is, I think, one of the best ways to do it peer to peer. All right. Um, and there's so much here, but I, I, I'm going to skip that. There's a lot of great data that comes out of this as well. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, elementary is peace, um, but we also have our third essential, um, which is that in this class, they're put into committees. Right? Um, there's a service committee, a social committee, and a professional committee. And they learn how to work in teams and committees. They learn what an agenda is, a proposal, what minutes are, right? They understand that, look, we, if we want a social ser uh, service project, maybe um, we got to put that together and have people um, have uh, other students work with us. So the service committee puts on different projects, different service projects, and um, does uh, service projects in the community as well as in, their, in their, their elementary. They have a VP for each committee and they do so much service, uh, genuine, authentic service in their comunidad. The social committee um, prepares dances that they perform at assemblies and at conferences. They do Hispanic Heritage Month, right? Um, they uh, maybe perhaps create a Dia de los Muertos Day and help people understand that Dia de los Muertos isn't just watching Coco, um, but there's so much to it. And professional committee, they um, get professionals to come in in a lecture series through the class every other Friday, and there'd be a hygienist, an electrician, attorney, different professions that they learn and grow or provide opportunities to go on to college campuses. So each committee really work together to put this all into action. And that's the best part, right? These are young people who need a chance, who need an opportunity to lead. And this is a great platform. And they have president and a secretary and a historian of the class. And you can even have an English learner be a VP or president of the class. And why not, right? Now they start to develop their public speaking presentations or leading pres as leaders. So much that happens here. And it's a safe harbor for each and every one of them, right? Um, so they get excited about this because it's finally a time where they can shine and glow and be a part of the greater community as well. And they work with National Energy Student Council. They worked, but, but now they're in, taking a leadership role, okay? So that, that's a third essential. Um, and committees work strongly with others. Um, if you want to ever Google Latinos in Action or go on Instagram and just go to Latinos in Action, you will see the hundreds and thousands of Instagram accounts from different schools across the nation. And you will see that now they're on social media for good things and not just uh, yeah, everything else they're on for social media sometimes. So um, th that's our uh, our, uh, our our third essential. Our fourth essential. Next slide 
is our curriculum. Um, so if the kids are not tutoring and they're not in committee, the teacher's delivering this curriculum. It's a gradual release curriculum. I do, we do, you do. Um, we have, um, you know, culture responsive teaching, leadership development, um, social emotional learning, all into one. Um, and, um, you know, there's uh, 10, 11 units. Uh, each unit has lesson plans, just like this one. There's um, objectives, introduction, um, review and assessment, instruction, attention, click, click, click. I mean, it's really teacher friendly. Um, next slide. Um, and and really, our, our hope is that um, our students can learn not only that the importance of giving back and leadership, but also getting ready for college. So a lot of the curriculum is really uh, college readiness curriculum as well, and and career. Right, um, not everybody's going to go to a D1 college. Some are going to choose other other um, paths, and we want to prepare them. But but more than anything, we want them to know that and be confident and, and be sure of themselves and um, all these other uh, um, intangibles, right, that I actually we're going to speak about in a bit. Um, so next slide. Um, our, our students, you know, as we dig deeper, the longer they're in Latinos in Action, some take it from middle school all the way through high school. We have seen an increase in every one of these, um, uh, you know, upper level courses, extracurricular, they get more involved. Um, they just become a bigger part of not just the fabric of your school, but also your community, which is really what you want. You want them to be involved. You want them to be out there and building the resume without having to call it a resume builder or checklist, right? So um, I think next slide. We uh, are now in 13 different states. We've just added a little more than actually this shows here. Uh, 9,000 plus students um, and and growing. Why? Because our young people are hungry. Tienen hambre. They want to lead. They want to do more. And we need a platform where they, they can showcase their talents um, and their schema. And um, I think we're providing that. Actually, I know that, that we are. And, and that's what we can talk about. How do we know? How do we know this? Right? Um, and next slide. Um, our, our college students were amazing. Um, we have college chapters, you know, 85% of our kids matriculate onto college. And so we started chapters of, uh, you know, at all our universities that were near um, the schools and districts that were implementing Latinos in Action. Um, it was incredible, the growth, it's been fast. Um, we're gonna continue to grow. But, you know, we, we had um, some evidence and we were doing great uh, collecting data. But the thought was, how do we know? Um, uh, and how do we have continuous quality improvement? And um, what 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 is telling us that? We had some long-term data, but how do we have formative data uh, for assessment to, to really understand what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we can improve? And so here's we're gonna where we're gonna bring in Hello Insight and, and um, Sally who who will explain really what came next for us. Um, and I was so excited to work with Hello Insight and all they had to offer in helping us understand um, better what we're doing, how we can do it better and where we're headed. Thanks so much, Dr. Enriquez. Hi folks, I'm Sally Munimetsu calling in from Baltimore, actually not too far from the NEKC Foundation. Um, I'm always inspired by Dr. Enriquez's um, history, I, it, it harkens back to the fact that, you know, I'm third generation um, Asian American and I was joking with him earlier that I wish there was an Asians in action back when I was in school and being able to connect back to my culture and my own peers. So it was really a great to be able to get to know him and his team over the last few months. Um, so let me give you a bit of a background around Hello Insight. And so on the next slide, you'll see that as Dr. Enriquez was sharing is he knows that there is more success than just those, just the, the college admittances and, and um, new AP, um, you know, uh, enrollment and such. And we too understand that. Um, our team is really unique in that we are social scientists, data scientists, uh, capacity builders, all with a deep focus on youth development. And so we too know, especially in the out of school time space, how much more is happening with our programs than, when, than just looking at success as tests and scores. And so with that then on the next slide, you'll see that what we started out in this concept of Hello Insight back in 2013, 
was this idea that, you know, my partner, um, Dr. Kim Sable Flores, um, and I had both been doing uh, one-off program evaluations for years. And we wanted to be able to tie those various insights together. And so in this day and age with technology, we kept thinking there's gotta be a, a better way where you know, um, evaluation and learning has to be more accessible to more um, communities, uh, especially young um, communities of color and to be part of the larger um, evidence base in our fields. And so being able to be tied to the NEA Casey's um, role with this, you know, it's been really great to see all that data really coming to the forefront, especially for communities of color, since that was one of our biggest missions with Hello Insight. And so in the next slide, you'll see that we, that's exactly what we've tried to do is bring in and say hello to evidence and insights, being able to tie variety of programs across the country. Um, when Kim and I would be engaging youth development organizations and programs, they would always talk about how, you know, we're so unique. We need our individual evaluation. We need it super customized to ourselves. And then we would push back and say, well, can we agree to some common areas that we all see developing in young people? And so as much as they consider themselves snowflakes and unique, uh, my partner Kim would always say, well, but aren't we all part of, made out of water? And that really resonated with the youth development community. And then that's where we started down this path of, you know, the young um, Jose that we saw in the earlier slide. What was he like before and after? And then on the next slide, you'll see the responses that people talked about. And um, my partner, Kim, had been a researcher, uh, frontline staff in Harlem, New York, but eventually became the director of evaluation and research over at the Thrive Foundation in Silicon Valley, where she actually ended up funding some of the seminal research in uh, what is now called social emotional learning. And so all of the terms on this screen, and unfortunately, because of academia, everyone has their own coined terms. But for those of you who are on the front lines and in youth development organizations, I'm assuming that many of those words resonate, that different funders ask for different outcomes related to that. But what it all boils down to, it is about young people's personal development. It is that soft, non-cognitive set of outcomes that we know our programs are developing. And so that's where we started, that that was the common thread tying together all of our different programs, whether they're college and career readiness, overnight camps. Um, we are national partners with the YMCA. So if you think about all of the variety of programs that they offer, this space of SEL became an area that most youth development programs could agree on. And on the next slide, you'll see and have reference to CASEL the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. Great website, wonderful set of resources. They even have a downloadable slide deck for those of you who need to make the case to stakeholders about why SEL matters. Um, we picked the space of social emotional learning because that was common across youth development and nonprofits had no idea how to measure. So that's where we started out with Hello Insight to, to um, develop a set of surveys that could get at that. But we also, because we've all been frontline staff, so like Dr. Nadikez, I too started out in um, education. I was a former middle school teacher. Um, and so this idea of what do we get on the front line? What do frontline staff need in order to want, you know, want to collect this kind of data and get evidence base built? And so that's where we also uniquely measure another body of research. And on the next slide, you'll see another big swath of names, all related to the concept of positive youth development. So this is the notion that how we interact with young people really matters, that how we see them as, um, as you know, great potential, we're not seeing them as juvenile delinquents, we're not seeing them as asset deficits, we are really seeing the positive, the potential, and so this whole field of positive development or any of those terms that you see on this screen, that's a set of practices that we wanted to get feedback from young people to see, well, are you, are you getting these practices in these programs? Because that is something very tangible that each program can you know, really support and develop other staff 
in order to make sure that SEL is developing. And now on the next slide as a resource, I did drop in the youth.gov um, definition, which is what we run by. Um, and so you see that resource there for you. And then on the next series of slides, I'm just gonna tie it all together. So of course, as a set of social scientists, we run with our own uh, research-based logic model. So it's the same kind of narrative that I just kind of mentioned that here on the left, right-hand side, these are all things that we want of young people, whether you're a parent, a teacher, um, you're, um, you know, the after-school provider, these are things that we all want for young people. And organizations like the Latinos in Action actually have longer term um, ability to track young people. So all great that they have some of that long-term data, but most OST programs don't have access to that. And it's often very expensive to get that kind of long-term longitudinal data. And so that's where we relied on the research and we have a whole bibliography that helps um, support that SEL, the next slide, shows that it does tie to long-term outcomes. Uh, and again, CASEL has a great set of um, slides that again, help tie the SEL to long-term outcomes and all of the great research there. Um, we happened to land on a set of five um, SEL areas in terms of really asking our nonprofit partners from the ground up, what does it look like? What is common? And we ended up picking these research-based areas to, to create a holistic set of SEL um, capacities that we're measuring. And then on the next slide, you'll see that we then tie in the positive youth development best practices. And so our platform is a true pre to post. So we are measuring young people right at pre, at the beginning of the program. We are just starting to get data in from LIA right now in terms of the new school year and understanding their developmental starts. Where are they strong and where do they have needs? And so because our team has always been frontline, we always have had the investment of a real-time give back. That each location across the country for LIA, each of those individual schools, each of those groups then gets a, um, a report back of what are, what are my young people? What are they coming in with? Where are they strong? Where do they have needs? And then at the post, um, we then can collect that same set of SEL, where are they now? And then also ask young people for their feedback of, did you receive these positive youth development best practices? And then that's the direct youth voice that uh, Dr. Enriquez and team are really listening to in order to continue to improve the program. Um, the next set of slides, it's just for your reference, um, just so if you go to helloinsight.org, you can learn cer certainly much more about us. But we wanted to at least give you the brief descriptions of the areas that we measure. And then on the next slide, it gives you a little teaser about, well, what does that look like from the youth perspective? We are a direct youth self-report survey. We ask, we truly believe in young people and their ability to you know, assess themselves. We know from our national data set, which is more than 200,000 young people and growing, that there is variance. So in terms of folks asking, well, you know, do young people take this seriously? We consider it to be serious when young people actually score themselves in a, in a, in a, in a, in a variant way. And we can see that young people are not just selecting all fives. And then the next slide gives you a sense of those research-based experiences. These are highly aligned with um, the, the Weikart Center for Youth Program Quality, as well as the Search Institute. So some of these terms may look familiar to you. So this also gives us an opportunity for Dr. Enriquez and team to say, hey, are young people having a quality experience in each of our schools? And as he continues to grow his footprint across the country, this is a way that he can be sure that they're all having the same high quality LIA experience. And then on the next slide, it'll give you a little bit of an insight. I've had the pleasure of working with uh, another of Suzanne's colleagues where we did some data mining. You know, one of the areas that the NEKC Foundation is particularly interested in is older young people. And so we did a preliminary data dive of, well, do we see what those older young people need more of? And when we were doing a deep data dive, we saw that the whole area of promoting peer bonds was super predictive, especially for boys and young men 16 and older. 
So that's where this idea of building an evidence base can not only help and support individual, um, you know, chapters of LIA, but certainly at the larger LIA um, organization. But then this is where the field can continue to learn and evolve and see how young people, what they need in order to develop. So just quickly, I'm going to just walk through how it works. And so we are leveraging, you know, 21st century technology. And so we have developed a series of tools um, that, um, that are all research based and valid and reliable. So those are all built into our own custom made platform. All the algorithms are run and created uh, based off of the pre existing data set. And so that 200,000 young people that continues to support and feed um, future use of the information. And we really wanted reports to be ready in real time. So as soon as any individual site of LIA's data are in, they can start to learn about their young people. They don't need to wait um, until the whole study is done. And so we're really trying to have this be part of continuous quality improvement. So with that, then I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Enriquez, who then introduce a little bit about how we started to work together. Yes, so, you know, you, Hello Inside presented to a Casey Foundation grantees and, and we were in there uh, and, and we were excited. I got excited because I was, I was thinking, wow, this is exactly what we need just to know and understand where we're at um, and what our young people need and what they're saying, right? Um, despite, despite being in the middle of COVID, we wanted to jump in with the, with the pilot right away and start learning and understanding. Even though we were more than halfway through the school year, we started our Hello Insight pilot in early spring about 2021. Yeah, springtime 2021. We were able to collect nearly 1,000 youth voices, which you know at times it was it was tough. Um, but this gave us insight into our impact for the last few months of our program across 10 different states. And that's what was also exciting. Um, this is an opportunity to learn about our young people and, and leverage Hello Insights national evidence base to, be, to just better support them and further build a culture of the CQI, right? Continuous quality improvement. We, we wanted to improve from within. How do we, how do we make, make this better? How do we do better? Um, Hello Insight then provided us with a, a dashboard uh, of an analysis and the student responses, which was fun to go through. The students, uh, the student participation in the surveys helped us learn our overall program impact on students' development in different SEO core capacities. Um, their, their satisfaction with the program, the ways in which students pr prefer to learn, students' foundational and uh, fortifying experiences with best practices for SEL development and much more, right? Uh, this data was extremely um, helpful to us on the management side to, to kind of understand how we can train our LIA class teachers in targeted ways, more intentional. And, and I think that's really what I wanted and what I loved about this is that I, I wanted to make our professional development and also our Educator Institute more intentional how do we help our teachers? Um, they come with so many talents as well. And how do we help them develop this? So it's exciting to build our own evidence base and to be more data driven, both with the pre and post program. Hello Inside allows us to kind of uh, be data driven in uh, real time and vivo, like right now, right? And as soon as our young people complete the survey, we can see their insights which totally, it completely helps us really start to um, shift and uh, turn it over uh, to Sally just to help her introduce our initial report in this next slide. Thanks, Dr. Enriquez. And so just wanted to share that real time pre um, data that we were able to see. And so it was, it was interesting learning more about the LIA model. I actually didn't know about the 30-40 um, model. 
it was really interesting in reflection to show to be able to re revisit their pre report, which is what you see on the screen. And what we're able to see there is what percent of young people have what we name as an emerging capacity that is against our national norm. Are they above or below that and emerging capacity just basically means high needs and SEL. And so what you see is overall, there was 75% of young people who have at least one um, emerging capacity in SEL. And when you open it up, which is the graphic there on the far right, it was interesting to then break it down. So we actually saw 25, 40, 35. And so that to me really, again, there's this idea of as LIA expands, are they also having fidelity to model? Of course, this assumes that SEL is also comparable to his own um, definitions of high achievers and such. Um, but it, it, thinking that it's a loose proxy, what I really did see here is how that fidelity model did happen. And then in the next slide, you'll see that same graphic that, you know, again, in our real time reports, it's just a quick toggle. It will then um, identify young people who match pre to post all the analytics of real time. And as data were coming in this summer, we were then seeing the great success that um, LIA has across the country. Again, with the caveat that we knew we were starting well into most um, sites programming. So even on the back end, half of the year, we saw that 93% of young people that we were able to survey did develop an SEL. And when we have that same graphic open up, you can actually see how deep that growth was. It wasn't just development in one area. It was more of certainly, you know, multiple areas. And if you, you know, uh, add up the graphic there, you see it's more than 75% are developing in three or more SEL areas. And so with this notion that I'm sure that the LIA team has is it's not a superficial development of young people. They go deep. And on the personal development of that, we can really then now start to see that in the data. And so um, wanting to ask uh, Dr. Adika, it's about, you know, how have you started to use these insights? Yeah, you know, what was great is uh, it, it came at a perfect timing for us because, you know, we we wanted to be, again, more intentional with our uh, professional development with teachers. So uh, we had an educator institute coming up um, and um, in this this past summer, we were able to really give them a sense of overall impact of LIA on SEL and give them confidence in the program and curriculum. So we, when we um, used it with them, uh, it was again twofold, right? Being able to show overall, but then helping them see the great things they were doing already and where they can improve, right? Um, sharing national numbers for the overall impact. We also shared back regional, um, more regional results with our staff um, so they could better understand the direct impact we were having as well as, as a staff. This also helped uh, them to know which schools had more room to for improvement and needed extra support on our end, right? Um, where our program managers could um, do better and what we needed to do better within uh, each district and region. Um, in the future, we would also be, you know, we'd like to use this data to, to report for grants um, and, and create annual reports, which many of our constituents and boards um, really love. And, and this is what, this is a, a game changer for us, right? Like to be able to take these reports to potential donors and sponsors who um, um, in so many ways, in many ways, many times wanted more um, data. And now we're going to be able to do that um, and make improvements to our program. So, um, really enjoyed that. Sally? Great. And then just tying it back to the original logic model, we had this next slide that also provides the real time data at post that I mentioned earlier, where we uniquely asked young people, well, what was the experience like in this program? And what we're measuring there are research based best practices in positive youth development. And one of our, what we call our foundational um, experiences is engaging authentically. You know, both Weichart and Search have a different name for that, you know, transformational relationships, developmental relationships. Um, we just call it an, an engaging young people authentically. And it's defined by those four areas. 
And what and, um, Dr. Aniquez and his team have then is this kind of data down to the individual, um, you know, chapter level at a school, as well as rolled up by their individual, you know, states that they work in. And then Dr. Aniquez and his national team have the overall set of data as well. And then that allows them to think about like, well, what, where do we need to provide more supports? Because from our original logic model that you saw on the screen earlier, I like to call those the dominoes, right? There were three major columns. And the first column was all about the program and youth experiences. And the domino and the research would say that if that first domino you know, falls harder, that is, it is stronger, then the other effects would also be exponential, right? And so this is where the, you know, continuous quality improvements can really be tangible down to the frontline staff. And as you can read here, this is not about us changing Dr. Enriquez's curriculum. It's literally all about how the staff are engaging with young people. How do the particular activities in the LIA curriculum really do exemplify these best practices? And then you can see specifically from the young people we, it's a Likert scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree. Our definition of young people received is what percent of young people said that this happened for me, that they, that they agreed or, or strongly agreed. And then this is a dashboard that LIA can then see where can we provide supports, you know, not only in our, um, you know, the educational teacher institutes, but on a more ongoing basis. You know, the team and I have been looking at their data across and then thinking about like, where can we, you know, knowing what the young people experienced in the past, what do we now need to do for you, the staff going forward? And this idea that we use the data on an ongoing basis and showing the frontline staff, like, look, you know, we're working on this because this is what the young people told us before. And we want to now see scores like, you know, in the 75s and 80s now going forward, that this is something that they are actually working on. So that's really exciting there. Um, and then, since I've already alluded to it, um, Dr. Nikas, can you talk a little bit more about the Educator Institute? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's one of my favorites. Uh, our institute, we bring veteran teachers along with new teachers together. Um, we have one in Utah, we have one in Florida, um, and, and other places, and, and I love it. Um, but we were able to share um, with our LA teachers the data for their specific region. So in South Florida, for instance, we were able to show districts at that, that point that, that, look, here's what you're doing and, and here's what you're doing comparably with a, a, some national data, right, on SEL, which I think is what I love about Hello Insight, that we can compare it, right, um, and, and helping them understand, like, look, you're doing amazing work. If, you, if nobody's told you, teachers, you're doing incredible with our youth. Um, and, and then also just, you know, um, what, what we can improve on um, and how we can better improve our practice. Uh, we had multiple training centers around SEL in our curriculum that they could then take their classroom, take it, take to their classrooms and apply to the areas of improvement from the survey data. And, you know, in, in engage, and they start to engage authentically uh, section, in, in this section, engage authentically, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, sorry, section of experiences, uh, the, the two highest, um, uh, quote, when young people share thoughts and opinions, let them know how much you value their ideas. That, that's one of the highest um, uh, sections that we received. Uh, the other one was, uh, quote, help young people feel safe and supported by consistently and purposefully applying their recommendations. And so those are two to the highest, both of these research based practices were rated 74%. So to be able to share that with our teachers was phenomenal, right? And help them understand, look, this is your strength right now. Um, uh, you know, on the counter side, we also wanted to say, look, where, where can we improve? So the lowest rated practice was, quote, take the time to really understand young people and their lives outside of the program, right? Um, which came in at, at 58%. Percent, um, and then as I mentioned before, these areas of improvement were, were shared with our teachers so that they can improve, and um, we as a staff can help support our teachers and and help give some tools or whatever it would be to to help them understand this and 
and make it better, right? Um, which is great. It's just an assessment, informative assessment that, that was live in vivo at that point in time. So that's the best part. Um, at, at this point, you know, I, I want to thank everybody for being here with us, with, with me um, and the others who uh, have been so generous from Annie and Casey, Hello Insight, to help us, uh, Latinos in Action, really improve our craft in, in helping like Latino youth um, be more empowered to uh, strengthen and lead their communities. There's nothing like it. And the better and more we dig into this data, um, the better our, our, our youth are gonna be in doing um, the things they do best um, and and um, helping others see how much talent and and brilliance they do have. So, um, so I, I guess we, we can open it up for some questions. Yes, and thank you. Thank you, Jose and, and Sally. Um, so interesting hearing about this innovative partnership and I'm really looking forward to the future insights the two of you will, will have for us. Um, yes, it's time for questions and we, we do have some. Um, let me start uh, by saying that uh, there are a couple questions. I'll just try to combine them. Um, is it possible, this is for you, um, Dr. Enriquez, um, is it possible to get copies of your college and career readiness curriculum? And if so, can it the course be adapted to be used in out of school time programming in communities where this course is not available? Mm. Um, I would say, uh, we can definitely share uh, our college career readiness curriculum. Um, obviously, it's a piece of what we do. So, we it, it, what we do is it's a framework, right? We have these four essentials, and we keep to those essentials and fidelity to those essentials. Um, and so, outside of that, um, I don't know how it would work, right? Um, I, and I think that um, a young me would have said yes. Um, but I've learned so much and I've learned to not mission uh, drift. And I, I want to make sure that schools are able to give these students an opportunity to do it during class because it's one thing to do it after school or have it as a club, but it's another thing to tell a student, I'm going to give you credit for your talents and assets, right? And so to have it in the, as a course is really our ideal um, way to do it in our mission, um, but I'd be more than willing to help with any other programs um, and build them and augment and support because I'm a, I'm a, a Latino at heart and I, I love to help wherever I can, um, but the, the curriculum itself, that's how, that's how it's, it's really delivered. It, it's best delivered during class time. Thank you. Um... So, you know, uh, Jose, it's obvious you're very passionate about your work and Sally, you as well. Uh, what advice do you both have for other program developers or researchers who might be listening in today about how they can continue to start or build uh, from an evidence base? Why has it been important for you and what advice do you have? Um, I guess I could start. I, I, I think uh, you mentioned passion. Um, you know, uh, my mom would be happy to say that I, I, I get that from my mom. Uh, and, and passion is uh, in the Enrique's home, it, it overflows. <laughs> We're passionate about what we do and how we do it. But passion, I also have learned, um, doesn't do everything and can't, um, it, it can only go so far, right? Um, I, I learned that and, and realized that I couldn't be everywhere, I couldn't show everybody that at all times. So we have to also be able to show it with numbers and show other people um, just how much we're moving, right? How much we're progressing, how much we're uh, impacting. And so I think this is, you know, the great part about Hello Insight and what we're doing is that we're going to be able to show also um, the growth and everything else with numbers and um, also have some formative ass uh, assessment and ways to improve our craft. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think uh, passion has driven me here. Um, now it's it's time to also augment it with other um, other things, such as um, just showing the uh, qualitative and quantitative piece to it. 
And I would chime in in terms of advice is that, I mean, the reason we created something like Hello Insight, and there are you know a variety of tools out there, is that we were trying to not recreate the, the wheel for you know hundreds of other nonprofits of individualized evaluation. And certainly we are not the end all be all. We know that you know beyond the SEL and positive youth development measures that we gather, that LIA is, in, 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 as an example, is so much more holistic, that they have so much more other types of data that could be collected and analyzed. But then we are a cost effective shared measurement platform. And I think the benefit there is then, you know, this data is in mind and we're able to then really understand, well, what kinds of young people need certain kinds of experiences. And I think that's one of the exciting aspects of that is um, certainly our um, Latinx data set will grow exponentially with our partnership with LIA. But this idea of what can we learn more about what is supportive of them. And I think as each of you think about what you want to embark in building your own evidence base, you know, look out in the field and see if there are, you know, pre-existing types of measurements that then you can also join into. Thank you, Sally. Well, I have you um, a short question, I think. How does the program collect Hello Insight data? It's fully online. And so feel free to reach out to me at, you know, sally at helloinsight.org. Um, but it is a fully online platform. We clearly have defaults to paper if people need it. But all what we try to do is address all of the pain points of being a frontline youth developer staffer. Like I, I, I don't have a PhD in analytics. How do I analyze this? I don't even know what questions to ask. Those types of things we've answered. We have a set or suite of tools to choose from. They're all valid and reliable. Um, all the analytics are real time, you know, and then it really is your time, your team's time to collect the data. But if more importantly, like LIA is doing is using the data. Um, that's the one of the biggest conundrums that we are facing at Hello Insight is we can do all we can with the real time data pre and post. But what we're really trying to really incentivize is the learning aspect, that true CQI. Thank you. Um, Jose, is uh, Latinos in Action, which um, our writer said was a fantastic program, it, has it been implemented within college programs for incarcerated young adults? Um, you know, that's a good question. I've been asked a couple times, and it would be an amazing program in those settings because they're uh, settings that are um, kind of in a class setting, right? Um, there are courses there as well. and. Um, it has not because uh, we just haven't, um, yeah, we haven't uh, been approached by somebody who would want to do that um, intentionally. Uh, and we're open to that. I think it would be great um, and powerful. Thank you. I agree. Um, I think one more um, fairly quick one. We've got a couple minutes. Um, again, for uh, you, Jose, do the LIA chapters leadership committees have a role in the design of the research? Um, would it be through the CQI process if so? Oh, that's a great question. You know, because we just started, we're, we're, we're getting all kinds of feedback. And I, th I love that you suggested that <laughs> in a roundabout way. I think our committees would be amazing at uh, giving that input. And those leaders, the VPs of those committees are, are pretty phenomenal. I just met some today. And, they're, they're always asking questions of just bright kids who, who want to do more and ask more. So I think that uh, we will probably definitely do that. All right, well, um, I think this brings us to the end of today's webinar. I thank you again, both of our presenters. Um, just just marvelous presentation. I, I, I learned something every time I, I listen to the two of you together. Again, great partnership. Um, Thank you uh, to our listening audience for your interest and your attention. Um, we hope we've provided you with some ideas to strengthen your own work. Uh, if not, there are more resources uh, for learning and you'll see them on this slide here. Um, Latinas in Action, Hello Inside, and the Positive Youth Development Experience Guides are all available to you. And as I said, we, um, we have uh, recorded this and I think you also saw it in the chat. So please feel free to uh, download um, or to call uh, our uh, or contact, I guess, our presenters um, for more information or check out their websites. So um, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon.